like to welcome all of you to our first Ford Pinellas meeting. Happy New Year. And with that, I'd like you all to stand and Mayor Julie Bajowski will lead us in the pledge and her invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if you'll remain standing, um, each to his own faith, please have a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. What we do first is I'd like to inter uh, I'd like to welcome Gina to our commission and Richie, both from St. Pete. And I just before we do our introductions, I'd like for you, we'll start with Richie, if you can just give us a couple minutes about tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, uh, thank you for welcoming me. I really appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so my name is Richie Floyd. I uh, am the new council member in St. Petersburg for District 8. I just swore in last uh, week, actually less than a week ago now. It was Thursday. Um, and uh, I'm a former Pinellas County Schools teacher, uh, active in political organizing. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I know. Uh, I'm not even really official until uh, after our next council meeting, yes. so I'm just here to sort of witness and, yes, and, and observe and learn, so I'm really grateful to be here. Thank you. Ms. Driscoll, would you like to say a couple words? Yes, thank you. Gina Driscoll, St. Petersburg City Council. I serve District 6 for the City of St. Petersburg and um, was just sworn in for my second term on City Council and also sworn in as this year's chair of the city council. I'm so excited to be joining Ford Pinellas representing PSTA um, this year. I'm serving now my fourth year on the board of PSTA and my second year as vice chair. So it's an honor to be representing PSTA and the city of St. Petersburg. And it's truly an honor to join you all to do this great work for our county. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. With that, uh, Commissioner Mertz, would you start with the introductions and we'll go around the room? Well, sure, thank you. Um, Commissioner Cliff Mers from the City of Safety Harbor, um, covering the northern municipalities of Oldsmar, Tarpon Springs, and Safety Harbor. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy New Year. Brandy Gabbard, uh, City Council Member for the City of St. Petersburg, District 2. Happy New Year, everybody. My name is Julie ward and I'm the mayor of the great city of Dunedin. Good afternoon, and I wanted to say thank you for that great lunch, and it was awesome, and kudos to J&J. &J. And um, Vice Mayor Patty Reed from City of Pinellas Park. Bonnie Noble, council member for Kenna City, representing the inland communities. I got a present for her. Uh, Michael Smith, uh, vice mayor of the city of Largo. Good afternoon and uh, welcome uh, to the new members. Uh, Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, my name is Dave Eggers. I'm a county commissioner and I represent District 4, which is the north end of the county. Hello, everybody. Dave Albritton, representing City of Clearwater. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janet Long. I represent District 1 and my seat is countywide, so I'm an at-large commissioner. And thank you very much, Mayor, for the lunch. Hello, everybody. I'm Whit Blanton. I'm the executive director. I'm Cookie Kennedy. I'm the mayor of the city of Indian Rocks Beach, and I represent, normally I, I make a big deal and because I know the 10 beach communities that I represent, but since we're a little behind, I'll you just know there's 10 beach communities and I represent them. With that, I'm going to go to Tina. And are there any citizens wishing to be heard on any item not on the agenda for action by the board today? No, Madam Chair, there are not. Okay, Wit, I guess we're going to go up and we're going to do some recognitions and announcements. Yeah. If that's okay with you. Squeeze through here.
Well, I think we wanted to recognize uh, Commissioner Pat Gerard yes. uh, for her service on our board. Um, thank you for joining us here today. If you would come up for a moment. wanted to say um, we really enjoyed having you on our board. I thought you provided a lot of great leadership uh, and we look forward to continuing to work with you in your capacity as a county commissioner. Oh, totally. Are you still on the PSTA board as well? I chair the PSTA board. Chair the PSTA board. Excellent. That's awesome. Here's a gift from Board Nellis. Thank you. And I have a gift from the beaches. This okay. is the Plain Air Cottage Artists oh, good. I need from a the beaches cool. that represent all of your your old homes and instead of tearing them down and yes, building cool. something big they t restore them back to how they looked when they were in the 20s or 30s so uh, they paint all over uh, the beaches and i thought you would enjoy that very cool thank you would thank you, you like to say something just wanted to say i'll be back <laughs> 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 this was way too short this time <laughs> let's get a photo out here if we can Councilmember Rice here, um, but we also uh, will recognize her separately, but I also wanted to thank Councilmember Rice. She was the chair of our board over the last year, has served my whole time uh, on the board uh, here at Ford Pinellas, and she's also provided great leadership, and hopefully she'll be back at some yes. point. So we'll just give her these. Yep. We'll say that. And I'd like to mention Patty, our vice mayor from Pinellas Park, because today is her birthday. So happy birthday, Patty. And I have a little something for you that I'm going to leave you with your chair, OK? First on our agenda is the consent agenda. And with that, uh, do any board members wish to pull any items from the consent agenda to be handled individually? Okay. Commissioner Mertz would like to pull 5E. if there are any members of the public who wish to speak on the consent ag agenda? No, Madam Chair, there are not. Okay, so would you like to do the agenda? Well, okay. All right, so I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion to second. Okay, so we have C Council Member Gabbard and was it uh, Commissioner Michael Smith, okay. And we'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, and we'll now, Commissioner Mertz, if you'd like to speak on 5E. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I have just a general question on task two, the uh, target employer's needs assessment. So I'm not sure who could be the appropriate person from to, to address that too, would it be to you, Whit? Jared. Jared Austin is our project manager for this. Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. Jared Austin, Ford Pinellas. Yes. Good, a good afternoon. Um, and it, uh, off the cuff, I would just like to say that it's, it's very extensive. I, I, I appreciate that there's been a lot of discussion that we've had about this um, and discussions that we've included along the way I see are included in here, which, which uh, I think strengthens it. There, there's one question on task two, as I mentioned, I'd like to ask. And it, it talks about um, crafting a survey and soliciting insights from existing and targeted and desired target employers. Um, I, my, my question would be is the, the scope of that um, employers. Is it to be regional? or 
because to me this is a very unique opportunity. Um, there's 11 targeted employers listed here and if it just goes to the 11 target employers in our area, mm. it may miss opportunities that you could get from mm -hmm. target employers that might be outside our region. The, the end goal, of course, is to figure out what we need to attract those type of businesses. We've talked about skills assessment. We've talked about other things for, for training and stuff like that. But, you know, in the event that you only might have one or two, you won't necessarily get a real um, uh, good characteristic response. So I was wondering, uh, is the idea just to stay local or regional, or is the capability there to be able to go out to other avenues? And, you know, let's say if one of them is a Silicon Valley type place, of you course. know, find out what's going on in Silicon Valley, find out how that would apply, what things we could do here potentially to um, make this area more advantageous for that type of growth. Right, certainly. So um, just to address your point, um, so I do not believe the intent is to stay local, and I will just say that we have uh, spoken with uh, S.B. Friedman, um, who has joined Renaissance um, as sort of their primary economic uh, development consultant on this. Um, and one of the things that they have expressed interest in doing is actually uh, working with Pinellas County Economic Development and looking at their prospective tenants list, um, which are essentially folks who have thought about coming here, um, potentially in the past, or who are looking to come here, um, and, and essentially debating it and getting information from them um, through that survey as to why they may not have come here, um, what are some of the, the key things that could make Pinellas County more advantageous um, for them to potentially locate here in the future, for other folks to come here. Um, and that, I believe, is meant to be as broad as possible. So I don't think that the intent is just to remain local um, within Pinellas County. We do certainly want to look regionally and elsewhere. So outside of potential employers that might be considering would you foresee the survey going out to outside regional people other than those? Uh, that is certainly uh, a possibility. I know SB Friedman um, has a footprint. I mean, they're located in Chicago, but they certainly have done work and have a footprint all over the country, and I'm sure would be um, e fully equipped to do that type of work in the okay. survey. Yes. Okay. I, I think that that would be a very valuable addition. Certainly. This would be a... This is, a, I think, an incredible opportunity here to capture as mm -hmm. much information as we can. And so if that can be in incorporated in, I think that would make the, uh, the results that we get out of it that much better. Certainly, and I will definitely make them aware of those concerns. Okay, thank you. That's my only comment. Com Mayor. I'll just jump on Cliff's bandwagon. Okay. Because, um, you know, since COVID, we know, especially in the tech industry, um, people are able to work in multiple locations um, and probably will likely do that. So I think there are opportunities there Certainly. where people might want to live here doing a job for somebody that's located in California. And, you know, we have to think about those things, too. Absolutely. Even though I understand we're looking at industrial lands. But right. while we're at it, we should consider that. Absolutely. Okay. Anyone else? Cliff, that's a very good observation. Thank you, both of you, for the, those comments. Uh, we're going to need a motion. So Madam moved. Chair. Yes, ma'am. We will also need to take public comment since we're handling okay. this item separately. Uh, in looking at my sign-in, I do not have anyone here specifically addressing the consent agenda nor this item specifically. Thank you. Is there a motion? There is. So moved. Thank you. Mr. Mertz. And is there a second? Second. Was that David Albright. Albright? Okay. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. <clears throat> We're going to move on to 6A, which is our public hearing items. And these are with the Metropolitan Planning Organization. 6A is an amendment to the fiscal year 2021-22 through 2025-26. This is a transportation improvement program action. And Jensen Hackett will be with, up with us. 
And uh, would you please uh, present on the amendments? Yes, I will, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, happy birthday, by the way. Happy New Year to all the board members. Nice to see you again in 2022. Jensen Hackett here with the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, I will be going over six separate amendments to be amended into your transportation improvement program this afternoon which we will approve as one uh, large amendment at the end. Um, several of these include the addition of projects through legislative appropriation and transportation acts that were passed in 2020 and in 2021 for economic stability um, in response to some external events. For these amendments, I will need that motion for recommendation to your, uh, approve um, and a subsequent roll call vote. I will pause for any um, questions in between each amendment if needed. So the first project to be amended into the tip this afternoon is project 443780-3. This amendment is for the construction phase of lighting upgrades on US 19 from State Road 60 Gulf to Bay Boulevard to Countryside Boulevard in the amount of just over $306,000. This project will be replacing the existing yellow sodium lights to LED lighting along that corridor. This amendment does not affect any other projects that are within the current Ford Pinellas TIP and I can answer any specific questions on this project you may have at this time. Does anyone have any questions for Jensen? Hearing none, we'll move forward. Perfect. So the second amendment to be amended into your tip today is project 447-535-1. This amendment is for the advancement of the design phase of State Road 580 Skinner Boulevard's Complete Streets project in the city of Dunedin. Upon discussions with the city, the local funds contribution for the design work will be split over the next two state fiscal years, fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23, with the addition of 475,000 local funds and just about $1,000 of in-house state design funds into current year fiscal 22 and $125,000 of local funds and $704,000 of the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations, otherwise known as CRISA funds, into fiscal year 23. The funds are being simultaneously added into fiscal year 23 during this amendment to fully fund the entire design of this project. This amendment is needed to pull the local funds contribution from the city of Dunedin into the MPO's TIP and into the state TIP. This amendment does not affect any other projects that are within the current Ford Pinellas TIP. And if you have any questions, I can take those at this time. Any questions? Hearing none, we'll move on. Alrighty, so the third amendment to be amended into the tip is project 449-128-1. This amendment is for the addition of about $310,000 in design funds for pedestrian crossings at 22nd, 40th, 46th, and 55th streets along Alt US 19 or 5th Avenue North. These funds are through the American Rescue Plan Act funds, which is otherwise known as ARPA. This amendment does not affect any other projects that are within the current Ford Pinellas TIP. And if there are any questions, I can take those at this time. Are there any questions? Hearing none, move on. The final three projects to be amended into the tip this afternoon are 449-779-1, 449-780-1, and 449-781-1. These amendments are for the construction phase of the resurfacing of State Road 688 from just west of I-275 to I-275 in the amount of $452,700. State Road 688 from US 19 to 49th Street North with just over $2 million. And State Road 580 from east of Countryside Boulevard to east of Mueller's Lane in the amount of just under a $1 million. A majority of these funds are also coming from the ARPA Act funds. This amendment does not affect any other projects that are within the current Ford Pinellas TIP, and I can answer any questions on those at this time. And once again, I will need a motion and a subsequent roll, vault, roll call vote for approval. There we go. <laughs> any questions for Jensen at this time? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Jensen, for uh, 688, which is Olmerton Road, um, you know, there is a bike lane out there that's four feet maybe wide, and that's not consistent with the Florida design manual. Do you know if this resurfacing would remedy that by creating a standard bike lane on a road of that dimension? I'm not sure if this specific project is going to address that, but I can double check for you um, and get back with you. Um, I know that the resurfacing will at least improve it to the design manual, um, but other than that, I'm not sure if it's included in this specific project. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Jensen. And with that, uh, Tina, is there anyone who at this time would like to speak on this item? 
No, Madam Chair, there is not. Okay. And as Jensen said, that we will be voting the whole TIP amendments as a whole, as outlined, and I will need a motion. Commissioner Long, and is there a second? Okay. Council Member Driscoll. Okay, and this is a roll call vote. Council Member Driscoll? Yes. Commissioner Eggers? Aye. Commissioner Aye. Smith? Yes. Council Member Albritton? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Mers? Aye. Council Member Gabbard? Yes. Mayor Bujowski? Aye. Vice Mayor Reed? Yes. Council Member Noble? Yes. And Madam Chair? Yes, thank you, Tina. And the motion carries. We will now move on to the Pinellas Planning Council, which will be conducted as follows. I will first ask Ford Pinellas staff to present the items. The applicant, local governments are available for questions as needed. Once each presentation is given, I will then ask for proponents of the proposal to speak, then opponents. And finally, any citizen who wishes to comment or ask a question on the case. We will then hear rebuttal by the applicant as necessary and a staff response or summary. At this time, the board will ask questions and then I will close the public hearing and the board will deliberate and take action. So our first item is 6B1, which is KCW22. Zero 01, the city of St. Petersburg, and our presenter is Nuasheen. Thank you for being here today with Board Pinellas, and if you would present to the board. Thank you, Mayor Kennedy. Um, while I wait for the presentation to be pulled up, um, Happy New Year, Happy Birthday, and welcome to the two new board members. Um, for the record, my name is Nuasheen Rahman. I'm a planning analyst at Ford Pinellas. I'm just still waiting for the presentation to pop up. Also, St. Petersburg staff, is Britton Wilson here? She is, yes. She is? Okay. And she will be here if uh, available to ask any questions of Britton too. Madam Chair, may I suggest that we go out of order and hear the next case until I can resolve this situation with the communication staff? My apologies. No problem. Okay. We'll go on to item 6B3, KCW21-14, which is the city of Oldsmar. This is an action item. Again. I'm sorry, Chair. Would it be 6B3? Yes. I have that. I don't have one for me. Okay. Okay. I'm going to come in there. Okay. It would be 2202 submitted by the city yes. of Dunedin. Uh, 6B2, KCW2202, City of Dunedin, and New Rasheen will be presenting again. Thank you, Mayor Kennedy. So in this case, the City of Dunedin seeks to amend a property from residential low medium and preservation to the recreation open space and preservation categories. And the purpose of this amendment is to facilitate the use of the property as the Gladys E. Douglas Preserve. The amendment area is located on the corner of Keene Road and 1900 Virginia Avenue and is approximately 44.68 acres in size. Currently, it does have some single family residential homes on the property and is primarily green space um, and preservation. And surrounding uses include single family homes, other preservation uses, and a nearby cemetery. To provide some context for this amendment, um, these two parcels in the amendment area um, were acquired by the city of Dunedin in May of 2021 with significant financial contribution from Pinellas County. Um, a lot of the commissioners on this board may be familiar with that. And it is adjacent to a 55 acre lake, which is owned and operated by Southwest Florida Water Management District. And the city of Dunedin annexed this property into its own jurisdiction um, in order to amalgamate those properties to create a new nearly 100 acre public park, which is going to be known as the Gladys E. Douglas Preserve, and will all serve as public green space. Apologies, the slide doesn't seem to be moving forward. Thank you, so the following is an image of the west of the subject property. 
and next an image of the east of the subject property. Because of its location, it was somewhat difficult to get a front view of the property, but the idea is that it is a very large um, area of green space. The map in front of you shows the current countywide plan map categories of residential low, medium, and preservation with the density and intensity standards and permitted uses for the category listed in front of you. And the next slide shows the same map, but just with the standards for the preservation category. And as mentioned, this entire area will be converted for the use of um, the Gladys E. Douglas Preserve, which essentially just means that the entire area that is residential low, medium um, will become res recreation open space, and I have been informed by city staff that any of those single family homes or accessory structures that were on that property were go are going to be removed so that the entirety of the amendment area can be true public space. This particular amendment area is located within the scenic non-commercial corridor with specifically the residential classification, but the recreation open space and preservation categories are consistent with all the classifications of SNCCs, so this amendment meets that specific countywide consideration. To conclude, this proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the recreation open space and preservation categories. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. And in front of you are those very considerations. And lastly, there were no public comments received for this case concluding my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I also would be amiss not to mention, is the Dunning staff here, Francis Leong Sharp? I don't know. No. I don't believe I saw her. I'll okay. try to answer any questions that okay. I can. Perfect. Tina, are there any proponents wishing to be heard? Madam Chair, there are no proponents, opponents, or other citizens to be heard on this case. Thank you. Does the board have any questions at this time? We'll start with Michael. Okay, we'll go to Commissioner Edgars. Oh, oh go ahead. Oh, um, no, I just uh, just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, uh, I think you said that the made the donors were the city and the and the county. I believe the state had some impact, and 50% of the property was purchased by private interest. And I just wanted to make sure that that was on the record. I think that was a real a great example of of community partnership, government at all levels, plus the community itself. Thousands of people donated some funds for this, but in addition to that, there were some major donors as well. So, um, and I wasn't sure, maybe the mayor could speak to some of the buildings there that may stay for nature per, nature centers or whatever, maybe you could speak to that. Yeah, I think the ones that they were talking about being removed were things like garages, but there are, there's, there, there are some other buildings on the property that are likely gonna be converted or added on to, to have a, a public nature center. That's all. Anyone else? Any comments, mayor? Um, I also wanted to, to let the board know that um, by making this change, um, when it passes its second reading at the city commission, at my city commission in Dunedin, it will then, because it's under recreation and open space, that property can, I know there's agreements, but that property cannot be sold um, or altered its use uh, without a public referendum. So this change actually protects it more and it's in our charter. Very good. Anyone else wishing to speak at this time? Commissioner Mertz. Congratulations to Dunedin and to North County and everybody else. I think uh, a piece of property of this size, uh, considering the congestion, everything we have, it's just a, a gem. I think it's fantastic. And thank you. And we are working um, with uh, Swift Mud to take over the lake as well. Oh, okay. Anyone else? Council Member Driscoll. Thank you. I had the biggest smile on my face when I saw this on the agenda. I thought, what a great first meeting for me to be able to cast a vote for um, an effort that was Herculean and yet so incredibly inspiring and successful. Yes. Congratulations, um, Mayor, and to all those in the city Thank of Dunedin. You. This is a great victory for the environment and for the people. So. Um, Thank you for inspiring all of us on this, this fantastic project. I am thrilled to be here today to support it. Thank you. Very good. Okay, if there are not any 
more questions, then we need a motion. Move approval. And so we have a motion by Mayor Bujowski and a second by Councilman, Councilwoman Driscoll. And with that, we just need all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations, Mayor. Great and a, job. And a big thank you is deserved for the county as well because we wouldn't have been able to get it started without them. Norsheen, are we going to go back to 6B1? Yes, I believe it's pulled up right now okay. behind you, so we are good to go. Okay, good. Then you may present. Thank you, and thank you everyone for your patience as we figured this presentation out. So this next case is CW2201, submitted by the City of St. Petersburg. In this case, the city seeks to amend a property from the residential medium and multimodal corridor categories all to the residential high category. And the purpose of this proposed amendment is to allow for the development of multifamily residential units. The subject property is located on the northwest corner of 6th Street South and 32nd Avenue South with an area size of approximately 11 acres out of a larger 14.73 acre property. So the remaining 3.73 acres located outside of that highlighted area in yellow on the map in front of you are remaining unchanged. Currently, the site is vacant but was the site of a former mobile home park that is no longer there. And surrounding uses include multifamily residential homes, um, another mobile home park located to the south and an autom automobile oriented retail commercial use. The following is an image of the front of the subject property. Next an image of the east of the subject property. And lastly, an image of the west of the subject property. I apologize, there's a typo on that slide, but that is an image of the west of the subject property. And the map in front of you shows the current countywide plan map categories of residential medium and multimodal corridor with the standards for the residential medium category shown in front of you. And the next slide shows the standards for the multimodal corridor category, specifically showing the density and intensity standards for the relevant subcategory, which is the secondary corridor. And as mentioned, um, the intent of this amendment is to allow for the development of multifamily residential housing, um, the density of which would exceed that of which is allowable by the current residential medium category, hence the proposed amendment to the residential high category, and that is shown on this map in front of you, um, as well as the permitted uses and density and intensity standards for this category. Now, as you may be aware, all of our um, land use cases um, get evaluated against certain criteria, and one of which is whether the amendment area is located in the coastal high hazard area. And 4.6 acres of the western portion of this amendment area is located in the CHHA. However, the applicant has proposed a restrictive covenant which would limit residential development to the area outside of the CHHA. And this is according to the legal boundaries of the CHHA at the time of submission. Mission. And to provide some context on that, at the time that this application was submitted to the city of St. Petersburg, the 2016 CHHA legal boundary was in effect. So that is shown all on this map in front of you where the 2016 boundary is on the CHHA as the red line. And with the 2016 boundary, approximately 3.6 acres of the amendment area was in the CHHA. However, in 2021, after this application was submitted to the city, um, a new legal boundary for the CHHA um, was made available, and this extended the CHHA in multiple parts of the county and did impact this amendment area. So with the new 2021 boundary, which is shown as the green line on the map in front of you, approximately 4.6 acres of the amendment area is now in the CHHA. Now, the proposed development is for 264 units on the property, and without a restrictive covenant at all, if you were to build the units uniformly across the whole property, approximately or exactly 70 units of those 264 could have been built inside the CHHA without the restrictive covenant. 
and it is the intent of the developer to still build outside of the 2016 CHHA legal boundary since that was in effect at the time of submission. So within the extended boundary of the CHHA, there will now be 26 units built. And you can see this more clearly on the map as to where all the units will be placed. So in the area between the green line and the red line, which shows that acre difference between the 2016 boundary and the 2021 boundary, there will be 26 units. In the area outside of the 2021 legal boundary, which is everything to the right of the green line, there will be 238 proposed units. And within the 2016 legal boundary, which is everything to the left of the red line, there will be no units placed um, in the CHHA. So in all cases that involve the CHHA, the countywide rules does provide certain um, criteria to balance against, and I'll briefly be going over some of those. Um, one of them is access to emergency shelter space and evacuation routes, and this proposed amendment does have access to that, namely through its connection to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Street South, which is a designated evacuation route. And the amendment area is also utilizing existing and planned infrastructure and an existing disturbed area, because as I mentioned earlier, this was the site of a former mobile home park, so this is a property that has been utilized before. And a major criteria that we also look at um, is the potential for the reduction of density or intensity on the property and also strategically clustering the uses outside of the CHHA. So um, as I mentioned, with the current re designation of residential medium, if there wasn't a restrictive covenant, there could be 70 units um, constructed in the CHHA that, that we would then evaluate. Um, and the restrictive covenant, even with the new legal boundary, reduces those units to 26 units. So so even though this proposed amendment is requesting um, amendment to a category of a higher density, it is actually reducing that density due to the restrictive covenant by changing that 70 from, from 70 to 26 units. Um, as for the clustering of uses, um, there are going to be 238 units out of those 264 units um, built outside of the CHHA, and that means that 90% of the proposed development is to be built outside the CHHA, and the majority of the units are clustered outside of the CHHA. And as staff, we find that these balancing criteria do sufficiently mitigate impacts to the CHHA. To conclude, the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the residential height category. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. And in front of you is an analysis of those usual considerations. And lastly, locally, the city of St. Petersburg did receive comments regarding concerns about traffic and parking, but otherwise we as Ford Pinella staff did not receive any public comments for case CW2201, concluding my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nusheen. Tina, are there any proponents, opponents, or citizens who would like to be heard? We do have one proponent, and that is Craig Taraziki from Johnson Pope. Sir, if you'd like to come forward. Good afternoon, Craig Taraski. I'm an attorney with Johnson Pope representing the property owner, and, and I, although they are technically not the applicant before you, um, at this point I'd say just we're here to answer any questions that you may have about the, the uh, proposal. Okay. Thank you. Does any of the any of the board members do you have any questions? We'll start with Commissioner Mertz. Yes, thank you. Um, there's a uh, uh, just a question on the term. It uh, indicates that non-residential amenities will be developed in the portion of the property located in the CHHA. What, uh, what is meant by non-residential amenities? So it would be the amenities to support the multifamily development. Um, uh, clubhouse, uh, we proposed a community garden, um, other type of amenities that would be typical for that type of development. But they would not be homes. But not be homes. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Mayor Bajowski. How many stories is this when it goes to residential high? What's the plan there? Uh, these are low rise multifamily. I have the, the owner here that could probably answer that more specifically.
Sir, would you state your name? Sure, good afternoon, Mark Rios with Stonevig. Nice to meet you, all of you. Um, the largest building is four stories and then it tapers down to three stories and then one story for the clubhouse. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for anyone else on the board? Hearing none, thank you for- Question. Uh, the 26 units, or yeah, 26 units, what's gonna be the difference in build on that one? Is it the same as the, uh, the, the others? No, so the city of St. Petersburg has uh, additional resiliency requirements for building in the flood, you know, flood hazard areas. So uh, you talk about first floor elevations, um, different, different type of higher standard than outside of the flood hazard areas. Okay, all right, thank you. Anyone else at this time? Thank you. Thank you. Does the board have any questions for Nusheen? Nusheen, would you come back up here momentarily? Thank you. Mayor Bajowski. Actually, the, my question's not for her. My question okay. is for our St. Pete City Council members. Okay. Um, when I look at the, the map and I look at what is surrounding it, I'm thinking four stories next to all that single story. Or, I mean, I, I want to know how concerned you all are. This is your city and, you know, because if that was in my city, I'd be pretty concerned. I'm going to go with uh, Commissioner Gabard first, council person. <laughs> I know. We should all be the same title. Yeah. You can call me Brandy. That's okay. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, I don't personally have any concern. We did not hear a concern from the community surrounding. Um, it is on MLK, which is a major transit corridor, so important to increase density in those areas, which is certainly what getting the elevated height does. <laughs> Um, four stories and three stories, pretty minimal when you look at density increases along those corridors. Uh, we're not talking about huge high rises. And so I think a lot of those sort of developments are really going to be the future of a city like St. Petersburg, where we have no land really to redevelop otherwise. Thank you. Gina? I'm going to let... I'm, be, sorry, go no, ahead. No, I was going to let... Uh, oh, I'm... You and Gina, okay, Gina, you may go first. Thank you, and thank you so much for that for that question. I um, appreciate the opportunity to do a little bit of clarification on this. This particular property lies in my district in St. Petersburg, and I've done um, extensive research on the proposed development to make sure that it is quite compatible with the surrounding area, and I found that it is. This is a great opportunity for a, a pretty large tract of land, especially in St. Petersburg to be um, developed in a way that's not a high rise. As you mentioned, it's um, surrounded by you know, lots of single family homes. However, because this is a larger tract, um, the plans for landscaping, creating those good buffers is solid. Um, the homes that are located around it, on one side it's a, um, a mobile home park that is still in existence. Um, you find that this is an area that has lots of mature trees and a lot of that natural buffering uh, that we would normally be looking for. And as Councilmember Gabbard mentioned earlier, this is um, a relatively low rise um, development and so we haven't had any pushback and when I go out and, and, and drive that area, it, it gives me great confidence that this is going to fit in very well. Um, in addition to that, across the street is Lake Magori. So the folks who live in these, um, these new multifamily dwellings will be able to go across the street on a new crosswalk that's being <laughs> installed and um, take advantage of the, the parkland that we have there as well. So it all blends very well together. Thank, Thank you. you. Council Member Floyd, I'll let you have a few remarks too. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, present something that I found out about this area. So uh, right across the street to the south is a mobile home park and then to the north or where the uh, residential homes are, there is a lot of trees you can't see through. Uh, I uh, was over there not too long ago actually campaigning and uh, across the street in the mobile home park, uh, it actually was like majority snowbirds who didn't live there most of the year and had been empty for a long time during the pandemic. Um, and so it's not, uh, 
it's not necessarily going to have as big of an impact as you would expect right away uh, when you're surrounded by people because you can't see to one side and then the other side is sort of more of a, a vacation destination than people who live there uh, full time. And so I thought that that might um, sort of ease those concerns a little bit. I really appreciate everybody's feedback because in Dunedin, three and four stories is, is a high rise. So that's why I wanted the context. Very good. Is there anyone else at this time on the board who would wish to speak? Hearing none, this is an action item. So Madam Chair, for the record, I just want to report that there are no opponents or other citizens to be heard on this item either. I think Thank we only called for proponents. I just want to make okay. sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. Move approval. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there anyone opposed? We will move forward. Motion carries. And we will go to present presentations. Oh, we're back to Oldsmar. Okay. That is 6B3. CW 21-14, the city of Oldsmar. Nusheen will be presenting. Thank you, Mayor Kennedy. Um, as Mayor Kennedy mentioned, this is CW 21-14, submitted by the city of Oldsmar. And this case is a little bit more different in that the city of Oldsmar is seeking to amend standards within their existing activity center, which is known as their town center redevelopment plan. And the purpose of this proposed amendment is to allow for a density and intensity bonus in the town's local community redevelopment district, specifically in the town center commercial residential zone zoning district, which for the purpose of the presentation, I'll be referring to as the TCCR district. And the reason that you're seeing this case today is because amendments which increase the density or intensity filed on record for existing activity centers, even if it is an increase through a bonus, must go through the public hearing process. So essentially what you're voting on today and deliberating on is the consideration of allowing that density and intensity bonus to be an option in the TCCR district. The amendment area is located south of Tampa Road and north of State Road 580 and is approximately 38.6 acres in size. It is mostly developed, if you're familiar with this area, it's the Old Smart Town Center area and it has multiple uh, commercial uses, retail uses, um, hotels, and also houses um, the Old Smart City Hall and surrounding uses also include commercial uses to the north and residential uses to the south. Now, to provide context for the amendment area, it is comprised of Oldsmar's TCCR zoning district, and the city is proposing a density and intensity bonus, which is intended to incentivize transit-supportive, vertically integrated, mixed-use developments in the TCCR district itself. So that is the area that is highlighted in yellow on the map in front of you, and the TCCR district is just one part of the community redevelopment district. So to emphasize, this bonus would only be an option in the TCCR district and not the entirety of the community redevelopment district. And what these standards are um, is that it would propose a density and intensity bonus of up to 65 units per acre for residential uses and up to two FAR or floor area ratio for non-residential uses. Additionally, uh, the amendments designate a maximum of 150 units per acre for transient accommodations, such as hotels. And as I mentioned, the density and intensity bonus would only apply to the designated area on the map and not the entirety of the CRD. And this is only a bonus which has the option of being utilized for those specific development types that are transit-oriented, vertically integrated, mixed-use developments. And it's not a blanket increase in the current density and intensity standards of of the TCCR district or the CRD. So I'll be showing you some images of the amendment area. The first is at the main entrance um, of the Oldsmar Town Center. Um, next are some examples of those hotel uses in the amendment area and examples of the commercial retail uses in the amendment area as well. And lastly, just showing you east and west of Tampa Road, which runs directly in front of the amendment area. So, 
Today, the countywide plan map category is not changing for this amendment. It is remaining as activity center. As you can see on the map in front of you, you're just voting on amending the standards that exist within this area. But the density and intensity standards for this activity center is shown in front of you for the relevant subcategory of community activity center. And so because the countywide plan map category itself isn't changing, um, we have a need to look at the local future land use standards um, because essentially that is what is changing and we are voting on that today. So the map in front of you shows the local future land use map with the amendment area, the TCCR zoning district outlined in the dotted red line, and the remainder of the colored area is the greater CRD. Um, and you can also see on the table above the map um, the standards for the countywide rules for the community um, activity center and the current standards that the city of Oldsmar has for their community redevelopment district and then the proposed standards with the density and intensity bonus. And as you can see from the table in front of you, even with the density and intensity bonus applied to the maximum of um, its ability, the proposed bonus still falls within our countywide plan rule standards for a community activity center. So for example, um, as far as residential density goes, we allow up to 90 units per acre, but the city is more restrictive with 30 units per acre, but with the bonus, 65 units per acre could be allowed, and that is still well within um, our thresholds for the activity center. Similar to the St. Pete case, um, the coastal high hazard area is uh, something that um, we had to take into consideration for this amendment area, and approximately 73% of the amendment area is located in the CHHA and is pursuant to those same standards um, in the countywide rules. And something that I'd like to emphasize is that this area is already mostly fully developed, and this density and intensity bonus is something um, that would apply to perhaps redeveloping projects. Um, but in most of it is built out, and I'll be going through some of those same um, standards from the last case, for the first being access to emergency shelter space and evacuation routes. Um, so the amendment area is located along the Tampa State Road 580 corridor, which is a designated hurricane evacu evacuation route. And additionally, the city is requiring a development agreement for all proposed amendments that wish to utilize the density and intensity bonus. And this would be regardless of the CHHA impacts, but for any development that wishes to use this bonus, the city will be requiring a development agreement where they can essentially vet the proposal and ensure that it meets that goal of being vertically integrated, transit-oriented, mixed-use um, developments. And Specifically for the CHHA, the city is requiring um, the developments which utilize this bonus provide hur hurricane evacuation, closure, and reentry plans. Um, as for the utilization of existing and planned infrastructure and also the utilization of ex um, existing disturbed areas, this area has already been mostly developed and has the existing infrastructure to support those needs. Um, moving on to the next criteria for the overall reduction of density or intensity. Um, as mentioned, this requested amendment would only allow for the option of a density or intensity bonus in the CRD, and the remainder of the CRD is not changing in density, and the density is still within our thresholds for the activity center, as I showed on that table previously. And one of the criteria that we also consider is whether a proposed amendment is an integral part of the comprehensive planning process, and this TCCR zoning district is something that has been identified in the city of Oldsmar's comprehensive plan as an area um, in the city where redevelopment is encouraged. So to conclude, the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the activity center category. And on balance, it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. In front of you is an analysis of those considerations. And lastly, the city did receive a number of public comments at their planning board and city council meetings regarding this case. Um, comments included a range of approval, reasons for which um, are included but not limited to you know, the need for further physical and economic development and new opportunities in the city's downtown. Um, but also comments included denial, reasons for which included but aren't limited to transportation concerns, infrastructure concerns, and concerns and questions about the development process. Um, and your agenda packet, which is very large partly because of the number of public comments that were received um, that has all been included in the materials for this case, um, and all the public comments have been attached to this agenda item. Um, but that concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Does anyone on the board, Mr. Edgars, would you like to, Commissioner? A, a couple questions. For yes, you. sir. 
Yeah, Nusheen, you had mentioned that it was residential to the south. It seems to me, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, the main road to the south, there's a lot of commercial facing that road. There is maybe some residential, but the community beyond that to the south is certainly residential. So it's almost like a little bit of a barrier between that, what do they call it, S SRD, SRD. Um, you know, that little limited area. So, um, yeah, just, just, yeah, right there to the south. You can see the pink area. Correct. That, that there is a lot of commercial on there that kind of separates the residential area from the downtown. I just, just for clarification. Yes, and when I visited this area, the residential neighborhoods you can't even really see. There's a, there's a lot of buffer and, like you said, a barrier between that. So it's very much so strategically separated um, so that it's not melding together. And the only other question I had really is, um, well, two. Um, one is, um, what can be built on there now has a certain amount of, as you say, intensity and density. And what they're asking for is somewhat of a, a little bit of a change in mix more th than it is in, in actual density. Could you speak a little bit about what they could do now versus what they they might be able to do and what you know what might be generated from that? I might let um, Felicia Donnelly, who will be okay. giving her present, right. she'll be fine. giving a presentation next on it. That might answer your question. Um, and if you have further questions beyond that, we're happy to take them. But I'd like to give her the chance to present. Yeah, the other question would be for them as well. So thank you. Okay, Appreciate no problem. It. Any other questions? <coughs> thank you, Nusheen. Thank you. And at this time, there's a second presentation with the city manager of Oldsmar, Felicia Donnelly. Hi. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, good afternoon. I'd like to go ahead and um, address Commissioner Egger's question first before I forget through my presentation. So what we allow there now is six stories in height. We allow a, um, we have a discrepancy between our zoning code and our comp plan, but on the low end, a, a one point FAR. And then we also allow a 0.9 ISR. So for an impervious surface ratio. So that means six stories pretty much built out on 90% of the property at this point of commercial. And what, and then what will it, and then what you're asking for, the change and, would. And so we're asking for it to allow an incentive. So really to allow residential to come in the place of the commercial. Okay, so it's still so, gonna be six stories it's at still, most. Correct. We didn't change the height of the zoning. So the height of the zoning that's already allowed is six stories. That's not part of our amendment. Thank you. And we already have several six stories buildings on Tampa Road. Okay, so um, Nusheen gave kind of the technical from um, for Pinellas' perspective. I thought I'd take the opportunity to really talk to you all about um, Oldsmar downtown efforts. And, um, and before I start that, I did want to say that thank you for the continuance. Uh, we found a publication error when we were reviewing the documents. And so um, we had the opportunity to, to go back to our planning board for them to reconsider the item. Um, and they, uh, at, after further evaluation of the documentation that we presented, they, they uh, voted for in favor of this six to one. So your documentation, I think, says that it was, they voted against it six zero, which is true. But when we went back to the planning board, they voted for it six to one. And then it also went to our city council um, for the first reading of the ordinance, which is required, and it had substantial support at four to one. So Oldsmar is downtown. So this has been a redevelopment, has been a city council priority for many years, actually since about 1994. Um, the intent was always to develop and activate a develop an identifiable downtown different from Tampa Road. And the city has completed multiple concept plans over the year. So I'm gonna just go through some of the redevelopment efforts because I think it's relevant. So the city created a CRA in 1994, as I just said, and then they created a town center plan in 1996. The city actually um, owns seven acres of the property in, the, in, the, in this corridor next to City Hall. And so um, th these plans really address that property. So the city has several downtown um, plan concepts with a lot of public input. Old Square, REO Station, um, Park Plaza, Market Square, 
We hired USF to do a CRA master plan, a town center plan, and a town center sketch. Since 2001, I went back and counted, we had over 80 public agenda items to discuss downtown development efforts, and about 30 of those have occurred since, since 2019. Um, you can see this building, this is um, Old Square, this is one of the planning efforts, but you can see when Old Square was uh, presented, you could see that um, it's, it's, it's a, high, uh, a highly developed mixed use building, was an early on concept. So um, this was in 2005 to 2009, as you can see on the top right. So the higher density uses have always been contemplated for this corridor. You know, it's a multimodal transit corridor. Um, Tampa Road gets about 60,000 vehicles a day. These are just some of the um, iterations of this. So this is just for the City Hall site. In 2016, the city um, uh, commissioned USF and partnered with them to do a, a, a master plan for the CRA. I think it's interesting because this is a concept along, this shows Tampa Road, and this is the same City Hall property, but in 2016, I had 400,000 square feet of building on, our, on the seven acres that the city owns, and it included 137,000 square feet of housing and 106,000 square feet of commercial, and we can tell how the markets changed since 2016. So we had robust community engagement through all of these processes. In 2017, the city hired Stantec to refine that plan so that we could put it out for RFPs. And so in 2017, the city hired um, CBRE. When I checked their website, they said that they're the largest commercial um, real estate development firm in the world. And so in 2017, the city hired um, CBRE. They took this plan, they sent it out to 4,000 developers and interested party over like a six week period. We got zero responses. So I think that's important to note. So in 2017, you can see these buildings are, this is the plan that was presented. And this is a, a sketch that in 2019, um, our city council um, put together with the help of some community um, experts. So, um, so what does this all mean? So when and we, we put out something to CBRE, we got zero proposals to develop a downtown. And then in 2020, we had a um, proposal um, from Woodfield Development, and that was the, I'm gonna go back to my first slide. Um, that was a photograph on the first slide. So in 2020, the city received a development proposal for, for this project. This is Woodfield Development. It's a, it's a mixed use, vertically integrated um, proposal on the city hall site. So how does that relate to how do we get to this density change, right? This is one project, you're not approving a project. But it did serve as a demonstration of the need to increase the density along the corridor. All of the previous plans had contemplated increased density in that area, but, the, but frankly our CRD and our zoning didn't support that at this point. So the vision does, but the zoning didn't. So then back to kind of where we are today is that you know the current zoning regulations facilitate higher commercial over residential. So in order for a downtown, one of the things that we believe that we need is a, is a um, critical mass of people. And so you know, this proposed um, change, and just for context, it's provided an, just an incentive, a bonus, for transit-supported, mixed-use, vertically integrated development along Tampa Road. And so as you all know, reduces urban sprawl, provides efficiency in services, and encourages pedestrian activities. But we wanted to be careful so we didn't want to give a wholesale change. So, so that's only with a development agreement. We, we wanted to be careful about making sure that the, all development would, is subject to that in this TCCR district. We also have architectural guidelines for this district. So the development agreement provides a tool to expressly define a project's commitments for a specified time period. It strengthens the public planning process. Our development agreement in our code requires five agenda items at public meetings and two public hearings for any development agreement, whether that's our land or whether that is private or public. It also requires a master development plan and demonstration of consistency to Tampa Road requirements. So our master development plan is when we start addressing things like the capacity of our systems and 
um, uh, things like traffic impact study and whether our sewer or water has capacity. Our, our sewer and water plants um, right now have a lot of capacity. They're running at only 60, our water's at 65% and our sewer's at 67% of the capacity for which they can offer right now. And we have room to grow those facilities. Um, it also will require compliance to, to Florida Statute 163.31788A, um, which Nusheen talked about, including payments of a hurricane mitigation shelter fee, contribution of land or construction of hurricane shelters, and transportation facilities as appropriate. The city takes um, hurricane mitigation very seriously, given our location. And um, so we, we have an early uh, climate resiliency plan. We're doing a lot of um, those efforts in the city. We also adopted strict flood ordinances for building. So our development agreement, um, in addition, we require, as I just said, an enhanced coastal high hazard mitigation efforts. Um, all transient accommodation shall provide hurricane evacuation and closure plan that complies with Pinellas County hurricane evacuation plans and procedures. Um, we met early on with the, the Department of Emergency Services um, to ensure that um, this was uh, um, good. They even, um, at the, before we even drafted the changes to the comp plan so that they are aware. And so um, I, I think that this is a good model to address those on development by development with a development agreement. And then for multifamily residential dwelling agreements, our units, you'd have a hurricane evacuation reentry plan um, accordance to it. And as Nusheen said, it's located on a hurricane evacuation evacuation corridor. It's also everyone else's in Pinellas County, it's route out to Hillsborough County. We're kind of at the tip end of that terminus for that. Um, and to summarize, our proposed amendment furthers the city's downtown redevelopment efforts and complies with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6.5.3.1 of the countywide rules. And this is only requiring a development agreement with a master development plan and enhanced coastal high hazard mitigation requirements. We have sent our comp plan, proposed comp plan amendment to the state agencies in, ex in an expedited um, comp plan review process. So we've already received um, no objection letters from um, the State Department's DEO, um, FDEP, FDOT and Swift Mud. So we just um, have received those four letters of no objections for this amendment. I thought that you all should know that. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Is there anyone on the board who'd like to address anything with Felicia? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you, Felicia, uh, for the presentation. Um, First of all, congratulations on your promotion. Uh, this, I guess, effective this month or last month, whatever. It's this new city manager for Oldsmar. It's great to have you Thank on you. board. Thank um, you. I think you answered both my questions. The first one was kind of what you have now and what you're allowed to do. Um, and then, which would be after the, uh, the approval, uh, we talked, you're still talking six stories. I think the FAR goes from one to two. Is that? Correct, uh, for consistency with our, with our discrepancy in our documents. And what about the ISR? Is this ISR remains the same. Okay, and you really, since you don't have a, maybe a project specific, do you have a sense of traffic comparisons, uh, traffic generation comparisons of a commercial-based development like we like you can do now versus a little bit more residential? So, so we don't have traffic projections, but, but it's my understanding that residential actually produces less trips than commercial and retail. That's, that's what my understanding is too, so I just wanted that for the record. Um, I think that's all the questions I had uh, right now. And just one final thing. It seems to me that I've heard in that area because of the, um, the commercial pro uh, development that you have in and around Oldsmar, uh, which I'm very proud of, um, there's a real demand for residential. Uh, could you speak maybe to that, that inherent demand increase for residential in your community? Uh, certainly there's a demand for residential throughout the county. We, we are, we're also subject to that demand. So, um, you know, our, um, um, I, I speak to our um, community of businesses. We have about 1,100 businesses in Oldsmar. I don't know if you all knew that. So, so we have a lot of businesses here, and, and two of the things that they tell me consistently that they need is workforce talent and workforce housing. So, um, so being able to produce more housing units for for our sustainability and our economy of Oldsmar is extremely important. Thank you. That's all I had. Thank you, Commissioner Edgars. Is there any? 
Mayor Bajowski. Sorry. No, I'm happy. Um, you answered most of my questions as well. Can you talk to me about it being in a high hazard area? I understand that it's already allowable for six stories, right? Correct. But it's commercial use versus residential. And all this is doing is changing it from commercial to residential or the allowability upon negotiation, correct? That's correct. OK, so if somebody wanted to redevelop, because I mean, all of this stuff is the coastal high hazard came probably after a lot of these things were built, right? So what kind of things would you do or could you foresee doing to mitigate the issue of the flooding? Yeah, I think with, um, I don't know how to get back to my. Just tell me. Oh, just, just that we do this in, um, for the bonus incentive. We have the opportunity to require stricter standards for coastal high hazard, right? One of the benefits of having mixed use buildings, talking to Pinellas County Emergency Services, is that we're actually taking a residential population out of the flooding because they're located on the upper floors. Right. So that's a real benefit to this type of incentive. And. In order to change that, in order to, you know, to offer somebody the bonus, the density bonus, mm -hmm. um, but does it go higher than six stories or no? No, no six okay. stories it's is our height. High. So the density bonus, as, as we all know, when you do a development agreement, you're, you're going to negotiate for something. You want something. You want the public to gain something. You want the city to gain something. Um, can you foresee what kind of things you're looking to get out of it? Um, uh, not at this point because each development is different, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and um, just in, pre in negotiations with our uh, current development proposal that we have for City Hall, you know, we're looking at two acres of park space and we're looking at um, increased streetscape and wider sidewalks. We have five feet sidewalks in some of our areas downtown, which which is really small to put outdoor dining Tell on. Tell me about <laughs> it. So, so we're problem. looking at, you know, for, for development agreement gives us that opportunity. You know, it's a tool for local government to use to get those spaces as, as properties redevelop. So we have architectural standards and streetscape guidelines for, um, for uh, State Street. And then we have strict architectural standards on the other sites, like wraparound on Tampa Road as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Cliff. Um, uh, you had initially were talking about uh, six stories of, of commercial and then residential and commercial. Um, your discussion of um, issues with uh, the coastal high hazard and actually elevating residential, the, the mixed use would be envisioned how? Exactly that. So it's commercial office on the first floor, and then you know commercial retail office on the first floor, and then uh, residential on the higher floors. So um, you know after talking to uh, the, the emergency services, you know they we're primarily focused on on residential out of flood hazard, not so much commercial. So really, I, I think that's a good model um, for anyone facing coastal high hazard is to elevate the residential out of the um, out of the risk area. Okay, and then I had read through all the discussions. Um, um, a lot of the discussions were of unknowns that would occur, but the ability to, to do this under a development agreement would help to alleviate those unknowns as you went through this process. Absolutely, that's what, you know, development agreements are a great tool for local governments. Um, and, and this would, this is development agreements for all the private property too. It's not just our public property. So, so as any redevelopment happens along the corridor, you know, we get to the opportunity to, to ask for different things and to make sure that they um, mitigate any impact that they may have on our community and Pinellas County as a whole. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I noticed that uh, Mayor Sadell is here. Did you want to come up? Is there anything that you'd like to add? Or you, you come on up for a second and introduce yourself to anyone who might not know you and if there's anything that you'd like to add. Well, thank you. Of course, when you ask a mayor if they'd like to speak and you're talking about their city, Absolutely. there's only one answer. <laughs> <laughs> I did prepare some notes, and, and I'm going to stick to them in part because I. I realized that between the questions that came 
uh, from the board and the presentation both of staff and our staff that most of it has been answered. So let me just start off by uh, introducing myself. My name is Eric Seidel. I have the privilege of serving as mayor in the great city of Oldsmar. Uh, I want to start off by thanking all of you uh, for taking the time to review this very important change for our city. Uh, we know that it takes a lot of deliberate consideration when going through these. As I said, the staff uh, talked about some of the technical review and our staff did as, as well and some of the history. Uh, I want to talk to you just briefly about the practical reasons for this change. Uh, for over 20 years, almost 25 years, the city has attempted to build a small walkable downtown. Unfortunately, these efforts have been unsuccessful. The city has spent tax dollars acquiring land, land around City Hall for the purpose of building a town center. Uh, and we have received multiple proposals over the years from very viable developers. Here's the thing. Every proposal we've ever received would require a density change. This is not something new. It's something we face over and over again. And while most agree the property does not allow the current density to support the goals of a town center, the goal to create a bonus or incentive in density is to really avoid a carte blanche approach of saying, let's just change it all. Let's do it with restrictions. Increasing in living units uh, create an incentive to build a vertically mixed use development that meets multiple needs of our city. The city of Oldsmar currently lacks a, a viable incentive on density to have an activity center located in our high traffic area, which is Tampa Road. Increasing density in the Oldsmar Town Center will provide a location to encourage the residential growth in the right location on 580 and Tampa Road with mixed use that's vertical. The county comprehensive plan supports up to 90 units per acre in activity centers. Uh, the city is requesting an incentive that would only go up to 65 units, thus staying consistent with the county's plan and allowing a more modest fitting uh, development that fits Oldsmar's culture. In addition, Oldsmar needs the density uh, to assist in attracting development investors in the activity area. That would be both mixed use with retail on the bottom as part of a required development agreement as Felicia talked about. This will provide an anchor for a small walkable downtown area with high-end apartments, including more citizens residing on location to help support those new businesses expected in the Oldsmar Town Center. Oldsmar currently does not have any Class B or A apartments in our area. The closest available are actually in Hillsborough County. This is a common complaint of some of our larger uh, employers as they, uh, especially within our industrial section, who are attempting to recruit and place new workers. The density incentive will also save the community taxpayer dollars. As a ins density incentive can create a more favorable economic picture and would enable the city to negotiate public benefits funded by the developers, such as expanded parking and a parking structure, an activity, uh, active community park, pedestrian walk, and developer-funded infrastructure, just to name a few examples. So I thank you all for your time. I'm trying to keep it to three minutes. I didn't realize I was going to get the opportunity. My power would have wrote something longer. But all, all sincerity, we appreciate you considering this. Uh, this is a project that is extremely important to our community. And we have a long process to go before we approve any specific project with a lot of community input. So I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mayor Sardell. Uh, Tina, are there any proponents? Yes, Madam Chair, we have two proponents wishing to speak on this item. Okay. Uh, Mayor Seidel was the third, so now we're down to two. Okay. Um, the first is Vince Albanese, and he is a resident and business owner in Oldsmar. You'll have three minutes, sir. Okay. Hi. Hello there. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I am a 63-year resident of Pinellas County, and so I have lived in every fair town represented here. Uh, tomorrow, I'm having dinner in Dunedin. So we leave Oldsmar to have dinner somewhere else, and that's what's got to change. Um, uh, I have I, I, the experience that's being described here, I am living. So my home sold in 18 minutes, and I am living we decided to buy and remodel a 100-year-old home in the CRA, which is just south of this area. Um, the, uh, that is going to cost considerable. We're bringing it back to its 1925 standards and are very excited about doing that. However, in order to stay around here, um, we are in those apartments in Hillsborough County where we are paying $2,700 a month for a two-bedroom apartment in a community where there is a $500 fee to get on the waiting list to get into those apartments. So there is incredible demand. Um, we chose that property because I am now literally three blocks from Upper Tampa Bay. I'm three blocks from downtown. I'm 30 minutes from anywhere in the area. All my children and all the work and all the rest of those things. And the city's uh, fortuitous and prescient um, ability to acquire land over the course of many decades um, is something that simply can't be wasted. So in my opinion, uh, and while I was one of those that sat through four hours of discussion about this and the desire to have Oldsmar remain a quaint uh, town, it just simply doesn't rec ec fit the economic reality of where we are. Uh, it's growing. People like me are moving in, and uh, this is part of... Um, you know, part of, of change in a positive direction. There isn't a single problem that I heard mentioned that the tax revenue from that property, when fully developed, can't solve. So thank you for your time and uh, appreciate all the support. Thank you for coming before us. Next is Matt Clark. Hi, Mr. Clark. Hey, how are you? Good. Is that all right? Um, my name's Matt Clark. I uh, sit on the Code Enforcement Board, the Board of Adjustment, and I also ran for City Council in 2019, um, mainly with the, the interest at heart of downtown and trying to get it developed. And even though I didn't get on council, I lost my seat on that one. Um, it's still been something very passionate to me, so... I've maintained following uh, the process and understanding it because if this would have fell in my lap four years ago, I would have been opposing it because I wouldn't understand it, but now I understand <laughs> it. So, you know, you've got you to learn. Um, so, yeah, I'm a uh, proponent for the incentive. I'd, I'd really like to see it. I also, I didn't know Vince, but I just bought a, another 100 year old house in Oldsmar as well. So, um, I actually uh, own two houses in, in the city as well as a, a hotel business, one that uh, is, was popular for being bad, but now it's a good one. Um, so I've got nothing to gain by uh, wanting this to go through. Uh, if they develop another hotel at the end of the street, it's not in my best interest, but it's, it, it's it, to, to move forward and get the vote approved is a big plus for the city of Oldsmar. We really need it, so that's it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Okay. Tina, are there any opponents today? There are no opponents, but I would like to give a last call if there's any citizens that did not sign in that wish to address the board, but otherwise there's none further. Thank you, Tina. With that, we'll close the public hearing. Hey, uh, Mayor? Mayor. Yeah, there's one more there's person. One hand okay. Up. Come on up. <laughs> Look who it is, my <laughs> lord, Mr. Once a mayor, Davis, always a mayor, really? right? Woo! <laughs> Agreed. The, the clock has started. So, I, <laughs> <laughs> just cutting into my time. No. Okay. Good. 
So I, I just want to say thank you and Happy New Year to everybody. And it, uh, it's great to see this finally coming forward. I think uh, I've been through part of this process. I was on a council and mayor for over 10 years and was part of this process back then. Had we asked for this incentive bonus back then, we might be celebrating 20 years of a downtown instead of just, just now getting this started. I fully support our city staff's recommendation. I fully support Ford Pinellas. I think it falls within the criteria. Um, in fact, less, as Mayor Seidel mentioned, less than is actually being uh, afforded to us. So I fully support this. I was part of uh, uh, the PSTA, I was part of Ford Pinellas, and this is a transit corridor. And if there were any other place that this was going to go, it is right here on this property. And I, I think the city um, residents should, in some cases, be very happy that our city and other cities uh, have the forward vision to acquire properties so that you can control what goes on there with this development agreement. I think all cities should try and acquire property, and the county for that matter, uh, so that you do have some control. As you know, we don't own the flea market, so we're going to be subject to whatever that developer wants to put on there. And currently, as was stated by our our new lovely city manager, that there is some development that could already go in there right now. And I think if you read through the comments um, that we had, I sat through all of those meetings, and while there may be minor objections or NIMBYs, not in my backyards, um, I think the majority of the people that spoke out either weren't clear on what was going on or do want a downtown. Everybody that spoke, I think, in one way, shape, or form do want a downtown. I may say there might be one or two that just don't want anything, but we know that that's probably not going to happen because we didn't acquire that property for nothing to happen. Right. It doesn't gen any, generate any tax revenue. And uh, if the city doesn't uh, move forward with this, I would assume that the city would probably sell the property to recapture what they paid for it, and then we'll, we will have no control of it. So thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your vote. Thank and good you. to see you. Yes, good to see you. <laughs> Tina, is there anyone else? I don't think so. Okay, I'm, I'm just surveying to make sure. Okay, good. Uh, we'll close the public hearing. And any other questions with the board? Hearing none, I'm looking for a motion. And is there a second? So that would be Commissioner Long and Commissioner Albrighton. And We'll just, is there, uh, we'll just take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And is anyone opposed? Motion carries, thank you. We'll now move on to presentations and or action items. And with that is 7A, which is the PSTA activities report and council member Driscoll, would you like to give us your report? Uh, I would, thank you. Oh. Oh, no, sorry. Sorry, okay. Commissioner. Yep, go ahead. Thank you. Um, the last meeting of the PSTA board was held on December 8, 2021. Here are some of the items that were discussed. One, and always first and foremost, is the Clearwater Multimodal Transit Center. As many of you know, the PSTA um, Transit Center has long been outgrown in downtown Clearwater. It has also aged considerably, and it's very difficult to maintain it effectively at this point. So PSTA with local financial support from the city of Clearwater, FDOT, and Ford Pinellas applied for a raise grant. Um, however, we did receive the news in November that we did not receive that award. Now, we will be, um, we are asking the US DOT for a debriefing to understand the details of our applications review so that we can uh, look at, at ways that we can create a winning application the next time around. This project remains our number one capital investment priority, and it will be the focus of multiple applications for funding under the new Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Another key goal for PSTA is replacing our, um, our aging buses with electric buses. Um, the PSTA board um, approved in that meeting the purchase of 60 electric vehicles over the next five years. This will be funded by our federal formula grants, which includes the plan increase in federal formula dollars we expect to receive under um, the new transportation bill. This is also in line with PSTA's sustainable strategic plan 
And combined with our solar energy project, it's also one of our top priorities. Many of you may have heard that recently PSDA approved an agreement with Pinellas County Schools. Um, we are going, starting this month, we're allowing all students and faculty to ride PSTA for free by showing a valid ID badge. And um, we're already seeing great interest and have heard from other entities who are also interested in establishing um, the UPASS program. In preparation for the start of next school year, PSTA will work with Pinellas County Schools to assign select high school students to PSTA routes rather than a regular school bus to help support the school's transportation needs. In the area of waterborne transportation, PSTA continues to make that exploration of waterborne transportation a chief initiative. Um, apparently, our CEO for PSTA, Brad Miller, gave a presentation um, on potential investment options at the December meeting of Forward Pinellas' Waterborne Transportation Committee. That presentation is going to be shown to the PSTA board this month to further that conversation. Around the corner is spring break. While you'll hear more about that at the February meeting, PSTA and the City of Clearwater have negotiated an agreement to support Clearwater Beach during spring break 2022. This was something that was successful in past years. It was canceled in 2020 and 2021, um, but we believe that this, the free spring break park and ride will be well utilized this season. The next regular board meeting of PSDA will be held on January 26th at 9 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Driscoll. And uh, Commissioner Long, would you like to give a report from PSTA? No, T. Barter. You're oh, on yeah, T. Barter, T. Barter now. now. Yeah, excuse me, okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. So T. Barter's last board meeting was on Friday, November 19th in the Commission boardroom at the West Pasco Government Center. Staff provided an overview of T. Barter projects, including Envision 2030, T. Barter's Regional Transportation Development Plan. The plan reached over 10,000 viewers through various media campaigns and was approved by the board in June 2020, along with the Regional Transit Vision Network. Other initiatives included in the presentation were the RRT and the locally, locally preferred alternative, Commute Tampa Bay, TD Tampa Bay, Innovative Transit Technology Study, Pinellas Aerial Gondola Feasibility Study, the PSTA AVA Demonstration Project. Tibarta has provided $400,000 in funding and it is now running on Clearwater Beach. US 19 BRT Feasibility Study is in process. The Regional Mobility On Demand Feasibility Study is in process and the assessment of the best uses of the CSX corridor has been proposed and we did agree to move forward with that at the Tampa Bay Management Group last month. The interlocal agreement for local contributions, Alan Zimmett provided an update of the interlocal agreement requested by the board at the October meeting. The board approved a request of 17 cents per capita from member counties and cities. Council distributed a draft agreement to all jurisdictions in November and is gathering comments. Our state advocacy services, Ron Pierce from RSA and Associates provided an update. David Green, our executive director, visited Tallahassee in November and attended meetings with 12 of our legislators. He is scheduled to visit again in February. Representative Jackie Toledo filed a bill in November requesting $750,000 in operating funds for T-BARTA. Harry Glenn and Steve Palmer from Van Skoyak Associated Associates provided an update on our federal work. The House passed the Build Back Better Act. It will take at least six months for funds to be distributed and there is a period of five years to request funds 20, from 2022 to 2027. 
A regional rail workshop was held on December 10th during a joint meeting of the Suncoast, is that the SCTPA? That's the Suncoast Alliance, right? And TMA leadership group. The group unanimously passed two important resolutions. We endorsed the I-275 regional BRT project and we directed T-Barter to lead a feasibility study and financial analysis of the Brooksville and Clearwater CSX rail subdivisions. Staff is currently working with the MPOs, the transit agents, agencies, and FDOT to develop a scope of work. Our next meeting is going to be down in Manatee County. Okay. Yes. So. Any questions? Uh, I just wanted to follow okay. up real quick, if I can. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Long, for that report. Um, you know, I almost kind of forgot about the December 10th workshop that we had with FDOT on passenger rail, but it was significant. It's really the first time that the department has come to us uh, and said they are looking at a statewide passenger rail policy. They were here to listen. Um, thoughts, ideas, the role of the state. Um, I don't know that they got a lot of direct feedback on that, but they um, provided an email address where people could comment. Um, then there was a discussion uh, among the group about uh, you know, how we could work together in Tampa Bay to advance uh, passenger rail, whether it was if it, within the CSX corridor or, or elsewhere. And I thought that there was some really good dialogue and really good discussion there, but it's significant that FDOT um, is now more of an active participant as opposed to a passive participant. Um, and they are going to be uh, hopefully setting out some, some broad policy and some guidelines. And I was very encouraged by that. If you didn't get a chance to see the blog post that I wrote summarizing it, um, I would encourage you to look at the Ford Pinellas blog uh, on our website uh, because I, I wrote about 2,000 words on it and um, maybe it'll be enlightening to you. But thank you for covering that. Yes, David. I have a question regarding the gondola study. Uh, is that coming up soon? Um, I believe we, we're monitoring it, and I believe that they are close to developing some recommendations. Um, so, yes, we would have that on our agenda as soon as Tibarta is ready. I think they have plans to present it uh, to the counties, or to, to the Pinellas County, but also to the city of Clearwater and city of St. Petersburg. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to move to 7C, Sunrunner Rising Development Study Update, presentation by consultants Eric Bosman, Jared Schneider, and Kim Lee Horn. Hi, everybody. Yay! Hi. Cassandra. Very nice to see you all. Happy New Year. For those of you who I haven't worked with before, uh, welcome to Forward Pinellas. I'm Cassandra Borchers. I'm the Chief Development Officer at PSTA. And so proud today. And she's so awesome, too. <laughs> she is. <laughs> I'm so, it's so nice to be here, isn't it? Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today and introduce this project. Um, we have been working on it quite some time in conjunction with PSTA, uh, Forward Pinellas, the City of St. Petersburg, and the City of South Pasadena. Um, and it really um, makes me proud to think about how we've leveraged federal dollars, not only in the development of an infrastructure project that will transform Pinellas County uh, between downtown St. Petersburg and the beaches through the Sunrunner Bus Rapid Transit Project, but also how that connection to land use is made. Um, this project um, is supported through the Federal Transit Administration through their transit-oriented development pilot program. Uh, this was one of of two grants that we received, um, and that just shows how much support we have gotten from the federal government, not just on Sunrunner um, and the transit project, but also in the entire picture of what Sunrunner brings. So um, I do have here to give the presentation today, um, Eric Bosman um, and Jared Schneider from Kimley Horn. Uh, they've been working with all of us to take a look at how, how do we look at our land use differently um, around the stations on the Sunrunner. Uh, we've performed a, a very significant um, outreach and participation program along with this a project um, and the work with the, the cities and, and the staffs. Um, but there's always more to do. 
Um, and so we're bringing this to you as an information item today. Um, we will also continue to work with the cities. Um, the city of St. Petersburg has had a presentation, city of South Pasadena. Amazing. They were, are so excited um, about this project and also have had a recent presentation at the beginning of this month. A PSTA will hear this as an information item uh, later this month. And then over the next few months, we'll finalize this portion of the project and bring it back to you all for some kind of adoption or endorsement. In addition to this, um, once this phase of the project is complete, we will move on to the second grant that we received, which includes a business assistance program, um, as well as taking to th this work to the next step through a series of design guidelines. So while you will see it today and you will see it in a few months uh, for action, you will also continue to see the Sunrunner Rising Transit-Oriented Development Project uh, through those other efforts. And so with that, I will turn it over to Eric and, uh, and Rodney is also, I would just say before I go is, Rodney has been uh, your key staff person on this, and I couldn't have a better partner uh, with a staff member, so I really appreciate it. I know you all love him, but I love him more. Um, Rodney Wrong. Chapman, Wrong. so, yes. <laughs> so, Eric, take it away. Thank you so much, Cassandra. As, as Cassandra said, my name is Eric Bosman. I'm the project manager of the Kimley Horn team. You'll also hear from Jared Schneider, and I also want to mention that uh, Caroline Fraser, who's done a significant amount of the lifting on this project, is with us here this afternoon as well. Uh, what, what Jared and I want to walk you through is just a little bit of the study overview. We'll talk about the framework of how we have looked at transit-oriented development within this corridor. Uh, as Cassandra said, this isn't the transit study, this is the development study of how do we take the catalytic action that this investment will create and make sure that it creates the type of walkable, inclusive, mixed-use communities that then can utilize that transit to get to education, uh, entertainment, and economic opportunity. Well then, Jared will walk through some of the implementation steps that we are looking at. Again, all of that is in draft form right now as we continue to work with Ford Pinellas and our partners at each of the two cities, and we'll talk about next steps. Now, while the study has very much focused on the Sunrunner Corridor, I want to highlight that this is Pinellas County's first high-capacity transit line. And as such, while we've been focused on this corridor specifically, we've also been thinking about how this document will create a playbook of sorts that as you consider additional future high-capacity transit lines in the county, it sort of starts to form the foundation of how you think about transit-oriented development on more than just this corridor. So while today we're really going to talk about the city of St. Petersburg and South Pasadena, know that the potential for this to set precedent as we move forward for the county and the region as a whole is really important. Hopefully, as all of you know, the route for the Sunrunner begins in downtown St. Petersburg, right at the University of South Florida downtown campus, goes north up to First Avenue North, traveling westbound on First Avenue North through the city of St. Petersburg to South Pasadena, out to Pasadena Avenue where it continues through the city of South Pasadena and out to St. Pete Beach, and then back up Pasadena Avenue to First Avenue South where it continues eastbound back into the downtown area. As Cassandra mentioned, this process has been ongoing for about 18 months. Perfect timing for us to take all of the public engagement that we had planned and rethink it entirely to how we could do that safely and virtually. And what we found is that we've been more successful meeting with smaller stakeholder groups. We've had meetings with uh, our, our grass tops, with many of our community organizations that represent transit uh, needy populations, low income communities, certain uh, organizations and viewpoints along the corridor. We've met with developers to understand some of the market pressure and market opportunity that this investment brings. We held a series of corridor wide community virtual workshops and that pretty much proved the point that we needed to break it into smaller segments. And so then we held a series of stakeholder and uh, station-oriented community workshops focused on different segments of the corridor. Throughout this entire time, we've been staying in step with what's happening with the downtown mobility study, as well as with the city of St. Petersburg's 2050 plan. And really within the city of St. Petersburg, most of these recommendations aren't going to happen because of the adoption of this study, 
They're going to be embedded within the work that's going on in St. Pete 2050 so that all of the city's strategies are coming forward in one document and not conflicting in multiple documents. The staff's been working to coordinate all of that. As we think about transit-oriented development, we're really not talking about a new style of development. I mean, you all just had a terrific conversation about what's happening in Oldsmar. You know, this is very similar in that the type of community that you want to create around transit stations is more walkable, more connected, more lively, more vibrant, more mixed use. It requires that we create and encourage development forms that don't require automobiles to get everywhere that you need to go so that patrons can get from their place of work or their place of residence onto the transit and then back without needing a vehicle or necessarily an Uber or a Lyft or a transportation service to get there. But this is really a return to the way that we designed communities that people loved before we started designing around the automobile. Places that are more compact, that include active public spaces and active street fronts, a diversity of housing and retail and employment types, more dense concentrated patterns in a pedestrian oriented fashion. And because this is a significant public investment in transit, we've also been paying very close attention to how do we make sure that the opportunity that's created here isn't just for one demographic, but an opportunity that maintains housing affordability and housing attainment for all populations to be able to share within this transportation benefit and the lift that it will provide. As we've done that and looked at this corridor, we recognize that a one-size-fits-all approach to transit-oriented development wasn't going to work. Different parts of this corridor are at different places in their development evolution, both in terms of the physical character and context, as well as what the market is prepared to bring from a development perspective today versus 10 years or 20 years down the line. So to react to that, what we've done is created a series of place types from most intense downtown to least intense neighborhood oriented stations. And what Jared will walk you through is how we've started to analyze each of the station areas and create a framework that starts in close proximity in and around the transit stations to create these more walkable, inclusive communities and over time creates the flexibility for particularly these two cities, St. Petersburg and South Pasadena, to expand and be flexible as they move into the next wave of development. So with that, I'm gonna let trans uh, Jared walk you through some of the recommendations, and I'll come back to talk about money. Thanks so much, Eric. Jared Schneider with Kimley Horn, thanks for having me today. Eric did a great job describing the place types. Really, there's there's four types, and, and really going through this effort, we felt, again, this could be an opportunity for other corridors in the, the county as well. So this is really just, we're looking at it as a, as a pilot. But really starting from the left to the right, we started downtown and high intensity. It's already happening downtown St. Pete. How do we encourage that and the additional mobility and, and transit service? And then going you know slightly down to urban, and it's a gradual change. It's still pretty intense, high to medium stuff out there that's walkable. And then the village typology, what we see, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide, it's really an opportunity to create kind of what Oldsmar was just talking about as well, um, but a little bit more on, on kind of the housing, but then also the shopping and retail center. And then neighborhood drops down uh, even more, but providing a center or neighborhood retail within in some of our neighborhoods in St. Pete, we're very, very clear in trying to look at those transitions, especially in the residential areas. So this graphic shows, it really describes the 30 plus stations over 20 mile round trip and shows the four different place types from downtown St. Pete on the right and then we gradually change into urban. Again, we're, we're trying to be mindful of the transitions but that's still very high intense intensity. And then we have a pair of neighborhood stations in, in the center there where we show 40th Street, 49th, 58th Street stations. And then Village, again, that's where we're trying to create activity, a mix of uses, shopping, retail areas. So 66th Street in, in St. Petersburg, and then also creating a place in Gulfport Boulevard over there in, in South Pasadena. We also have the, the same setup in St. Peter, St. Pete Beach uh, along the, the, the three station areas there. Also with this effort, we looked at TOD readiness. How ready are stations today and into the future? And downtown, so in the darker color circle, you'll see downtown's really doing its thing. There's some tweaks that we're looking at. And this starts to set the framework for regulatory changes. 
Um, but the way we looked at this were, were really threefold, market potential, the land development potential, and then mobility potential today. And again, this could, Eric alluded to that, it could morph over time. But downtown we look at is, is ready, as is the 22nd Street stations in St. Pete, and then really kind of in the medium area as we move west. So now I'm going to transition to talk a little bit about the framework. We created station area plans for each of the stations. And, and really that started with the TOD readiness and the development potential that I just talked about. And then we mapped areas of stability, again, very sensitive to historic districts or single family um, established areas. So those in this graphic are shown in, in black there. And then in the, the lighter or the darker green, we started to look at what are those potential catalytic sites that can support the investment that's being made here in this corridor? And then we created a vision. So we looked at what are the, the higher intensity areas, particularly around the stations, um, and then how does that transition into the neighborhoods? What are those first and last mile mobility connections that we should be considering? So we outlined those for, for each of the station areas. So this is just an example of that. And then for the vision plan, we had a, a series of three buckets of recommendations. Um, what type of development regulatory changes should the cities be making, particularly St. Pete with the 2050 vision? Um, infrastructure improvements, what should we be looking at, again, to get people to and from those stations? And, and partnerships, so that's always, how do we fund it, right? I know that's something Whit, Whit talks about all the time. So it's looking at what types of agencies can we partner with, the, the, the private sector, and then the, the funding piece. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the regulatory uh, strategy specifically, and really those centered around four principles. Again, how can we look at the zoning um, to support TOD? And a lot of times it's, it's there in downtown, but there's tweaks we can be making. In other areas, we might have suburban style zoning um, around the station areas. How do we support TOD again? Housing opportunities, nobody's talking about that, right? How can we encourage more uh, different types of housing um, and equitable development? And then uh, how do we preserve the, the neighborhood character um, and enhance mobility? Again, that's getting people to and from the stations. A lot of what we've been talking about are the, the flexibility of uses around the corridor as well. So this slide gets into that a little bit even more. So in the station areas, we're looking at increased densities and intensities um, but applying different housing types. The added flexibility of employment uses, residential, retail, that's been a big discussion, particularly in the 22nd Street Station. How, how far do we go? Um, what's the range? What's the distance? So that, those are some of the discussions we're continuing to have. Um, and similar to what we had in the discussion about Old Smart, we looked at bonuses. So we're not trying to give densities away. There's things that have to be done with uh, attainable housing to, to get to the greater heights. Um, shared parking um, or parking maximums. Um, you know, minimum and maximum different types of unit mixes. So really trying to throw those out there as, as far as incentives. As far as the countywide rules for Fort Pinellas are concerned, we looked at creating major centers in several of the station areas, as well as a neighborhood center um, in the 40th Street area. So really, this slide, we're just trying to show that we're, we're fitting in the umbrella of the countywide rules. So now to transition to the infrastructure piece, what we're really looking at again, the mobility improvements, how do we, this is near and dear to my heart, how do we get people to and from the station safely and efficiently, pedestrians and bicyclists and, and other modes. Uh, lighting is something that's come up quite a bit. So how do we, how do we make people feel safe and, and, and it's lit? Um, also the capacity uh, along the stations, that's something that we, we're doing a build out analysis to look at, do, do we have the actual water, wastewater capacity in the areas to support that growth? And now I'm going to turn it over to Eric to talk about the funding strategies. Thank you. So one of the things we know from looking at projects like this across the country, and particularly the southeast and southwestern United States, is when you create this type of transit investment, this, this opportunity for people to get from one place to another without having to own or use an automobile to do it, the investment follows. Because these areas are so rare in many of our southern cities, uh, they're the types of environments that people are looking for, whether there are older citizens who don't want to drive or our youngest citizens who can't drive or also don't want to drive. Right. More and more we see our populations looking for this type of vibrant, walkable, interconnected community, and dollars follow. 
Now, that's a huge opportunity for you as a county and a region because there are funding mechanisms in order to capture some of that wealth creation to make sure that we create the level of community benefit that is envisioned. It's also a challenge because it can lead to pricing people out of communities. So one of the things that will be part of the study is looking at some value capture case studies across the country and some recommendations for how you might create a mechanism that helps capture some of the rising property values that will happen in order to ensure that the community benefit is provided. As we talk about things like infrastructure investments and inclusive and attainable housing and many of the public uh, private opportunities that this will create. So we're looking at a number of different mechanisms. I, I can already do a little bit of foreshadowing and tell you that we really think that some sort of value capture mechanism like a, a tax incremental financing or similar mechanism could make a tremendous amount of sense in a corridor like this that then will provide a revenue stream in order to create those community benefits and make sure that we are truly creating a corridor that is for all of Pinellas County and not just for those that can afford it. So as we've gone on this journey over the last 18 months, we've really tried to create a plan that is tailored to this corridor, but that's also very realistic from a market standpoint. Um, I, this is one of the corridors that I'm working on right now where I've been astonished we have not gotten a lot of pushback in terms of increased densities and concentrations of development. I mean, your community really understands that where it's going to happen along major transit lines is the place to make it happen. If anything, my bigger fear is we're not gonna be able to go far enough uh, to satisfy the demand that may come to us in the short term. But again, that's a great opportunity for you all. We've tried to think big throughout the study, but also start small making sure that those first steps happen in connection to the transit stations so that it truly creates that walkable environment, not just far enough away from the station that you're really not getting the land use transportation uplift from these working in concert with each other. So it's been very exciting to work with, uh, with the two communities. As Cassandra mentioned, in terms of next steps, we're continuing to work through the public engagement process to receive input and to modify these uh, station plans for each individual station. We're working on the value capture analysis as well as completing the infrastructure analysis for each station. We're starting to put together the final documents and our plan is to first go to the city of St. Petersburg and the city of South Pasadena, then come back to Ford Pinellas and ultimately to the PSTA board for completion of the plan later this spring. So that completes our update for today and we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Is there anyone on the board that has any questions today? Okay, hearing none, thank you for coming in. It was a great presentation. I think everybody's pretty excited about this and um, we don't have any ac action on it, but we know we will later down the road. So we will see you down the road then, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna move on to uh, 7D with WIT, the Downtown St. Pete Mobility Study. And he's gonna whiz right through this. <laughs> I, I, told, I leaned over and told you that. <laughs> he did. Yes. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I, I feel like it's time to bring this to you all. We have made this presentation to the city of uh, St. Petersburg, so I really just want to highlight um, why we're looking at the downtown mobility study and what some of our initial recommendations are. Uh, where we are right now is we are waiting on a final uh, document um, to be reviewed uh, by our Department of Transportation partners, uh, and then we will bring back to you an action plan with some uh, for, for action and recommendation uh, to you and the City Council. Uh, this is the study area boundary that we're looking at. Uh, the focus is really on 175 to 375. The black line you see on the map is really where we're looking at neighborhood impacts associated uh, with this. But we really, you know, uh, wanted to think about all the growth that's happening in downtown St. Petersburg, uh, the innovation district to the Tropicana Field site uh, and all the housing that's happening down there. And there really hasn't been uh, a long range vision look at the transportation network to see how consistent it is with the city's own goals and with uh, our own uh, goals here at Ford Pinellas. Uh, and the focus has been to test different network 
alternatives, uh, not to come up with a, uh, a, a grab bag of all the potential transportation projects because the city has done a pretty good job at looking at complete streets and its own local network improvements, but what are some of the bigger changes in, in the potential road network that we may want to consider and partner with? Um, so that has really been focused on converting some of the one-way streets to two-way streets and also potential removal of the interstate spurs, 175 and 375, for the goal of having better neighborhood connectivity and improved safety because those uh, interstate spurs have created a barrier to Campbell Park, uh, historic uptown, and some of the other neighborhoods uh, around downtown. Um, so I'm just gonna walk you through the key projects and some of the findings. First is uh, Dr. M.L. King Jr. Street or 9th Street and 8th Street. Uh, those are one-way streets currently. We have a number of crash hotspots where we have a lot of crashes happening, particularly at 5th Avenue North. Uh, this would improve safety at those locations by converting them to two-way streets because two-way streets provide better visibility for people uh, who are using the roadway and, and to businesses. Uh, the analysis, the, the technical modeling that we did of future conditions in 2045 uh, showed that there would be very stable flow on both of these streets if we made that conversion, less than 35 seconds of intersection delay in the future, uh, and that's with an additional 15,000 people and an additional 13,000 jobs in the study area. So we, we think we were pretty aggressive with that population and employment growth. Uh, and we would remove the diagonal streets to reconnect the street grid uh, that exists and permeates most of downtown St. Petersburg. Uh, there would be some congestion in the PM peak hour north of Fifth Avenue North, but that's a function of a healthy downtown and uh, there's not many downtowns that don't have some congestion. So it's a balancing act and we feel that, that could be an acceptable balance for these roadways. Um, and there's a little bit of travel time increase because we are slowing down the traffic speeds. We would have more consistent travel at 30 uh, miles an hour as opposed 40 to 45 miles an hour, which happens quite often on these roadways. And this would enable about 2.2 miles of additional walkable streets, bike paths, sidewalks. And if you've been on these roads, there aren't many businesses that front these roadways today. And uh, the city did a real nice job on 9th Street North, but that uh, continuity of bicycling facilities breaks down and ends when you get into the downtown core. So this would allow that continuity of bicycling through downtown to continue. Uh, 3rd and 4th Street is the next street that we looked at uh, for potential conversion. And if you drive through there today, it's kind of maddening um, just navigating around to go north or to go south if you're coming from an east-west direction. And again, we found that there would not be any real significant congestion with this conversion here. Uh, the fire department did express some concerns about being able to get out into traffic. Uh, they have difficulty today and they think it could be harder uh, with a two-way street, so we will take that into account um, as this moves into design. Um, this would improve safety at several hotspots, less than a minute of travel time increase, about 1.6 miles of walkable streets, um, and again, uh, less than 35 seconds of additional delay. So we've found similar um, uh, acceptability from a traffic standpoint to 8th and 9th. And these have been talked about by city council for a long, long time, just hadn't really been fully studied. Uh, the city uh, has some ideas about what to do within the right of way there too. So now we get to the bigger projects and we are looking at potential removal of I-375 and 175 and I'll start with 375 first. Uh, we have a number of safety hotspots as you have this merge between traffic entering and exiting the interstate system uh, with the local surface street system and that speed differential creates some, some problems there. Uh, this uh, has an opportunity to create more of a gateway and connectivity of those neighborhoods. So you would have uh, more opportunity to do some interesting uh, uh, things for bicycling and walking here. And you already received a presentation from FDOT about their sort of interim look at Fifth Avenue North uh, through this segment. And they'll be coming back to us uh, in the future with what they're planning there. 
Um, there is some congestion, though, that begins to occur with 375 removal, uh, particularly on westbound 5th Avenue North and on 16th Street. Uh, but this uh, has an opportunity for about 25 or so acres of additional development uh, or redevelopment opportunities. Uh, but there's more of delay getting to and from St. Anthony's Hospital, uh, and then uh, almost a minute more of delay at two separate intersections on 16th Street uh, due to more people using that to get to the interstate than the 375. Uh, we were also told by FDOT that removing or considering moving uh, this uh, interstate spur could jeopardize the funding we have in place for design and the permits that we've received from Federal Highway, the approvals to move forward with the 275 lane continuity and managed lanes project. So that gives us great pause at considering uh, this uh, because that other project has been a longtime priority of the MPO. Uh, we would retain a full interchange, but that interchange would need to be modified. Uh, so this has some opportunities. It does, I mean, we heard from a lot of neighborhoods around here that would like to see this go away, uh, but we've also heard the concerns um, from people uh, losing it. And um, the traffic increase is something that gives us all a little bit of pause. Um, let's see, I'll just, this doesn't, we looked at a partial removal as well, but the results were largely the same as the full removal. So either you do it all or you don't do it. There's not much to be gained from just a partial removal. Plus we'd introduce a roundabout and nobody likes roundabouts. I'm joking on that. Uh, for the 175 removal, um, we think there's more potential here. And this really started from the Tropicana Field Master Plan in 2016, uh, when, the city, when the city's consultant said that if you really want to create a neighborhood uh, and not just a stadium or a venue, uh, then the 175 is essential. It has to be removed. Uh, and uh, so the city, that gained a, a little bit of traction, and that's where we decided to do this study as a result of that. Uh, this would uh, reconnect uh, the southern part of downtown St. Petersburg and those surrounding neighborhoods to the economic opportunities that will be at Tropicana Field and Central Avenue and all of that, and would restore some of the legacy of the gas plant neighborhood uh, that was destroyed for Tropicana Field and all those um, homes and businesses relocated. Uh, so what we find here is that um, stable traffic flow on uh, Fifth Avenue South and Fourth Avenue South with less than 35 seconds of intersection delay. That's a worst case uh, scenario. Uh, improved safety at the real critical hotspot at the entrance to USF St. Pete uh, at Fifth Street, Sixth Street area. Um, this would open up about four miles of walkable streets and bike paths, the potential of putting in a, um, a tree-lined boulevard that would be a great gateway into the innovation district. Um, there is some travel time increase to the hospitals, um, and that's for you and me driving, not emergency vehicles with, with sirens blaring, uh, but that travel time increase is because we would slow down traffic speeds from 60, 65 um, to maybe 30, 35 miles per hour along the, the boulevard. Uh, streets will not be congested. Uh, our modeling shows that the grid street network functions well, uh, and you do have room in this quarter to add some capacity to 5th and 4th south that you don't have on 375 with 4th and 5th north. Um, and we would create eight new street connections into the Campbell Park and historic Rosa Park neighborhoods, uh, allowing about 25 acres of new development opportunities uh, that could be oriented towards those neighborhoods and communities. Uh, you could do a lot of things with that land. It doesn't have to be developed. It could be parkland, uh, but there's a, a lot of, we've heard from communities saying economic opportunity or housing or things like that. Uh, we would maintain uh, and update uh, the interchange at Fifth Avenue South. That would need to be modified to maintain access to 175. We had no intention of losing that connectivity. So I've talked about some of these opportunities for the project. Um, both of these would require extensive further study. It would be a long term proposition. Um, best case scenario is you're looking eight to 10 years out uh, for anything to, to happen from a construction standpoint. And even that is a pretty aggressive schedule. But this stems from the history of, of you know, demarcating a barrier uh, between uh, the 
prosperous areas and redeveloping areas uh, from some of the neighborhoods to the south. This shows 450 feet of right of way, what that looks like next to the stadium and what a barrier in terms of elevation and visual um, um, uh, blight this has caused uh, on the neighborhoods. And this picture really summarizes it well, where you have Tropicana Field, the freeway, and then Campbell Park uh, below it. Um, so the idea is to knit the city together and reintegrate the Tropicana field with the rest of the grid system. And I shared an anecdote with the city council that I'll share with you. Um, I was involved uh, to a degree uh, on the periphery of the Baldwin Park redevelopment in Orlando, which was the old Naval Training Center. And the city uh, insisted on the redevelopment of that site to reconnect with the street grid that existed in the cities of Winter Park and the city of Orlando. Um, because they wanted that to be um, a seamless development, not a walled off community. And there was a lot of fears about the traffic and the impacts of putting 9,000 new residences in the old Naval Training Center. But by recreating that grid, that really never happened. Uh, and I lived an eighth of a mile north of Baldwin Park in Winter Park for uh, 11 years. And um, it, it was really seamless and very easy to connect. And that's the same vision that the city has for the Tropicana Field site. And it requires uh, uh, modifying or removing the interstate spur for that to happen. These are some images taken from a 1972 study uh, that, that was done to remove the interstate spur. And if you look at this area shaded in yellow, that's the footprint of the interstate spur. And you can see all the homes and businesses that were relocated to that. I don't think we'd be able to do that today, given the current laws uh, and, and policies in place. These are some of the newspaper articles from the time uh, which uh, talked about um, the rationale for building these. And it was the fear that the sprawl uh, and, and growth in Western St. Pete around the Tyrone Square area would draw business away from downtown, particularly the waterfront. So these were built to um, have people fly over, pass through uh, these um, declining neighborhoods were um, African-American neighborhoods, frankly, and get to the waterfront businesses. And um, that's really not the case anymore. We really don't have that situation today uh, that we had in 1969, 1970, 1972. Uh, this is from the report in 1972 uh, that talked about uh, the improvements here. There was uh, an expansion of the park uh, in Campbell Park, uh, but they talked about major relocation, uh, fiscal problems encountered by the poor does not exhaust the problems they face. They kind of downplayed the whole removal of, of homes, businesses, families uh, from this area. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it was pretty, pretty blatant uh, in terms of um, the characterization of these impacts. And you can see the demolished buildings. Um, we did have presentations to the Campbell Park neighborhood, Historic Roser Park, all the downtown business associations. The, the feedback has been overwhelmingly favorable. Uh, it, I won't say it's been uniformly favorable, but overwhelmingly favorable. Um, and this is from the Campbell Park neighborhood where they were very eager to see 175 removed. Um, we've had extensive public outreach, lots of surveys, thousands of comments. I think we've, through the pandemic, done a very good job of getting out to the community. There's still more we're going to be doing. I'm still going to make more presentations, um, and we want to have an open dialogue as this goes forward. Um, just to show the timeline, um, strongly supportive of 175 is the darker part of the circle there. Unsupportive is the smaller part. So there's been less support for 375, but even that has been a little more supportive uh, based on all who we've talked to. Um, so this has been going on since February of 2020. So I want to pause here and just let you know that for the one-way to two-way conversions, there's a little easier path. Uh, that's still going to involve some engineering and design, and the public will be involved in that. Uh, the Department of Transportation is willing to work with the city on 4th and 3rd because those are state-maintained roadways, and the city is willing to accept jurisdiction, maintenance, and ownership of 3rd and 4th from the state in exchange for the funding to make this a, a two-way facility. For 8th and 9th, that's a city-owned roadway, so that's an even simpler process that is purely a city decision, and Ford Pinellas, frankly, would need to be involved in, in that decision. 
Uh, for the interstate, um, that's a big decision. And that not only involves the city, it involves Ford Pinellas, uh, it involves our district DOT, Tallahassee Central Office DOT, and the Federal Highway Administration in Washington. So there's a lot of players here. And uh, the next phase of this would be really more of a uh, concept engineering feasibility study, not a PD&E study per se. But that uh, is something the department has agreed to fund. Uh, they were going to use one of their consultants to come up with the engineering concepts for three alternatives. Those three alternatives broadly are um, removal of the interstate and look at a boulevard, uh, an at-grade uh, facility, if you will. The second would be to look at a viaduct or a flyover, which would maintain the interstate but allow achieving of the goals of more permeability uh, so that you would be able to connect underneath it. Uh, and that would be parallel to what Orlando is doing with the Interstate 4 project uh, and what Miami is doing with I-395, where they're building a trail and a park and other active space underneath the interstate. And I think that's pretty exciting, and that could be an acceptable alternative as well. The third alternative would be a do-nothing or a no-build alternative. Um, the viaduct or flyover option possibly would entail a narrower footprint because we don't need four lanes in each direction because we're only using about 60% of the capacity of this roadway, even in the peak hour. So it's really not very congested um, ever. Uh, there are some operational improvements that are needed to get from I-275 to 175. There are some slowdowns in the AM peak hour. Those are being addressed uh, as part of the I-275 corridor, so we're hopeful that that will remedy some of those operational uh, challenges today. So that, uh, just a high-level overview, I wanted to get you all up to speed on what we were looking at. Uh, we'll have a lot more opportunity to discuss this in the future, and we'll take more time when we need an action from you. But I wanted to see if you had any questions for me at this point. Any questions? Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Witt. You're going to go on to your director's report quickly. I could have just stood up there, I guess. You're Okay. All right, let me get back to my agenda. I had a couple things I wanted to highlight for you here uh, under my report, and I'll, again, I'll be uh, very brief. Uh, first, just in terms of our spotlight update, um, we are uh, underway with our investment corridor uh, strategic planning update, and I met with the uh, county administration and the city of Largo in the last couple of weeks and we let them know that we are looking at the Alt US 19 corridor from Clearwater South to the Sunrunner corridor, and county staff, uh, the administrator, and uh, public works engineering were very enthusiastic about that because they have some regional stormwater projects they would like to look at in that corridor as well. Largo was extremely enthusiastic from a staff standpoint, uh, so we will bring that back to you in March uh, for approval. Uh, we're in the process of engaging some of our consultants today, and I wanted to make sure um, uh, you were okay with that. We're reaching out to three of our consultants uh, after today's meeting, and um, we'll be in asking them to give us an approach and a fee for doing the investment corridor for all US 19. And this is budgeted um, in, our, uh, in our budget. Any questions about that? You're good with us proceeding so far. I think we've explained the investment corridor to you a good bit. Uh, the next item is the Clearwater Memorial Causeway busway. Um, you may remember, some of you, that uh, a few years ago, PSTA got a legislative earmark for a million dollars to study the idea of a dedicated busway between downtown and the beach. Um, it was funded for design. It wasn't for alternatives development. Ultimately, the city of Clearwater felt that the design would conflict with the landscaping that they really value as a gateway treatment into the, the, the beach and uh, told us uh, we had about $300,000 left on that design to look at how to, how to make Clearwater more comfortable with um, a busway concept. And um, they told us to um, move on uh, and pass. They weren't interested in continuing to explore the busway because of the impacts uh, to the landscaping. So we've closed that contract and we've told DOT to uh, return the $300,000 that was remaining in that. Yes. 
Can you describe what a busway is? It's a dedicated travel way for buses to bypass the traffic congestion that, that exists during peak season uh, on the Memorial Causeway uh, that backs up you know, pretty far uh, um, out Court Street, out sometimes out to Missouri even. Um, the idea would that you would give preferential treatment for people to park remotely uh, and take transit where there's limited parking and a lot of congestion over the beach. Um, but, you know, we do have the water taxi. We are looking at the aerial gondola. And I think the city felt like those were maybe better alternatives uh, than a dedicated busway because of the impacts and difficulty getting the bus back into the traffic stream when you get closer to the roundabout on the west end. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Albritton, does that accurately reflect the city's perspective? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we've, we've always been real proud of our median going to the beach and keeping that, you know, with flowers and landscaping. And, uh, and you know, the, 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 bridge was, the bridge was constructed mainly, it was designed to carry something down the center lane, you know. And then when they had problems with the construction of the bridge, I'm not sure whether that would, uh, we, we, at least the message I got, we were unsure whether it would carry a gondola or something down the middle. So, and then, then you got the bottleneck at the other end. So, yeah, it's best that we probably just drop that. I'll just say this is one of the dangers of legislative earmarks because we got yeah. kind of stuck in a pickle and we couldn't really look at alternatives. Um, also, the northern side of the bridge has mangroves and we would have impacted those. We couldn't go on the north side. Uh, next is the Waterborne Transportation Committee. I just wanted to allow, uh, let you all know that next steps um, after kind of a rocky meeting in December is that we um, have kind of regrouped uh, and we are um, revisiting the proposals we present to you. We are having some one-on-one -on -one meetings with all of the Waterborne Committee members. Uh, I had a productive meeting with the county administrator um, and, and, and got him up to speed. So, you know, I think we're still gonna um, fight our way through this and I think we'll have some good outcomes, uh, but there's a price tag associated with this and how we pay for it is always the, the tough nut. So stay tuned on that. I, I think we'll come up with something that we can work with. Uh, I wanted to let you know that we are getting closer to starting um, a safety project on Gulf Boulevard in St. Pete Beach and Treasure Island. Both communities wanted to be involved. They are both jointly helping fund the, uh, the safety project. Uh, we did unfortunately have a fatality on Gulf Boulevard, a pedestrian fatality a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it continues to be a really unsafe roadway for a lot of folks, so uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll bring that back to you when we have some recommendations. And then finally, the State Road 580 Skinner Boulevard uh, Pinellas Trail Crossing. Uh, we will be putting in a full traffic signal uh, at that crossing as an interim safety measure pending the funding of the city's Complete Streets project on Skinner, which has been advanced. Uh, so I want to thank Joan Rice and the, and the county and the city of Dunedin and FDOT for coming together uh, on uh, jointly um, uh, recommended solutions uh, for that which uh, we hope will avoid uh, the difficulties we've had with some fatalities and near misses uh, out there. That's my spotlight update. Any questions on that? I'll just move right on into the legislative committee update. Uh, earlier today, the legislative committee met uh, to go over some uh, bills of, of significance and the committee um, v uh, asked the full board to support sending um, a letter or putting some materials together regarding a bill that would open up the door of our industrial and employment lands for mixed use development that's not even affordable housing. Uh, some unspecified percentage would have to be affordable housing. We've already gone down that path with House Bill 1339 from the 2020 session and St. Pete's already enacted that ordinance. Uh, this would kick that door wide open and allow for mixed use development um, and would prevent counties and cities and organizations like ours from denying that development in affordable housing areas. Um, so we have some real heartburn about that. And um, I would like to get an, an action from the board, I think we still have a quorum here, um, to support putting together um, some talking points for our legislative delegation. There was some concern on the committee that we can't be too stridently opposed because the bill seems to have traction and support from Senator um, Jennifer Bradley of Jacksonville, but maybe using our, our lobbyists 
to um, get the inside scoop on why she's advocating for this bill. Um, so, um, Councilmember Gabbard, does that accurately reflect what we're seeking? Absolutely. Um, just the importance of, you know, the fact that it is incredible preemption on policies that we have had longstanding here in the county and work that we have done that's been fairly groundbreaking uh, regarding the 1339 legislation that was passed a couple of years ago. Um, this is just what we feel is a step too far and just opens it up too much um, beyond our control at that point. So um, I would make a motion at this time that we direct WIT and staff to move forward with um, I would call it a uh, informational piece and a request for more information from our delegation and our legislators um, that we can move forward to uh, proactively address this bill. Okay. Can we have a second? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is the status update on the local government adoption of the Safe oh, Streets with, Pinellas. Yes. With one moment, did we want to announce our Tallahassee oh, news? Yeah. I, I was thinking that and then I forgot about it. Sorry. So yes, February 1st and 2nd, mm -hmm. uh, we are planning to go to Tallahassee. Uh, uh, Councilmember Gabbard and I are going for sure. We've invited the legislative committee members, any board member who wants to go and join us there. Uh, it's an opportunity to build some relationships and talk about some of the things we're doing at Ford Pinellas and in Pinellas County and in our communities. Uh, we will be developing some handout materials related to these bills of interest. Uh, we don't have a specific schedule, but we're working on setting up some meetings and would encourage you all to join us if you don't mind the eight hours of travel to Tallahassee. All right, uh, I'll keep going. Uh, status update on the Safe Streets Pinellas resolution. I want to thank the City of Dunedin, City of Largo for recently adopting this resolution to join Pinellas County. Treasure Island, St. Pete Beach, and way back, City of Indian Rocks Beach. It might have been the first city. Um, so, but that still leaves um, more than a dozen uh, cities uh, that haven't adopted that. And that so, that is your homework. Yep. Just letting you know, I will hound you. If you know me, you know I'm a hound. If you don't know me, I'm telling you I'm a hound. I will <laughs> hound you. <laughs> and we have the draft resolution in your packet. Um, Pinellas County made some modifications to it. We're not um, going to worry about wordsmithing. All it does is signal a commitment to working together in partnership to drive down our safety and serious injury numbers, which are pretty bad. Uh, we do kill uh, two people on average every day in Pinellas County on our roadways. Um, so uh, any help you can do. I think if we have unanimous support or near unanimous support, it really will help us get some of those federal dollars in Pinellas County by showing up. Um, and then the last item I wanted to cover is um, the summer meeting cancellation. Typically, we cancel the August meeting uh, to allow for some vacations and time off. During our executive committee meeting, um, Commissioner Seal mentioned that the county tends to take July off and not August, and it actually works out better for them if we were to skip July versus August. We don't need to take action on this today. Uh, but I would like to maybe by March uh, make that decision. And I just wanted to check your temperature and pulse to see if anybody was really hanging on August uh, or if you had a concern one way or the other. We do the August takeoff too because we do all our budget meetings in July. And so we have probably three or four extra meetings in the month. So we give ourselves a break in August. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in on July versus August at this point? We'll think about it uh, and we'll bring it back for action probably by your March meeting. We'll need to get this out in advance, but for those of us who are making uh, summer vacation plans and haven't yet figured out when they're going to baseball games, if they're going to baseball games, if there's a baseball season, um, you know, we want to know in advance. Speaking in the royal we, of course. What? It's me, not Cookie. Oh, okay, I'm looking around. I just want to say for the record, I have already had an inquiry from a local government regarding that we're showing both of them as cancellations. So I don't know if we could do it in February versus March, but I'm already getting an inquiry about it. Okay, we can do it in February. There's no real magic to it. 
All right, um, and then last thing, this is the last meeting we're gonna hold, I think, here at this location. Uh, our meeting in, in February will be at the Palm Room in downtown Clearwater. It's a new space that the county is building out in the communications building. Tina will give you all the insights and information. And I have parking passes with me today, so anybody who's misplaced or lost their former MPO parking decal for your dashboard to park in our covered metered spots, you can see me or Maria today and get a parking pass. That is it. Okay. Uh, we will be sending, if you haven't already gotten to each of the board members, kind of uh, a, a project involving Ford Pinellas that you can share with your boards, so that gives you something to talk about. Don't forget that you'll have the annual report. You can mention items in that to start, you know, your conversations with your commissions. Whit and I are going to start the road show again and come and visit your commission, spend 15, 20 minutes, that's it, just kind of updating everyone, what we're doing, what you guys are doing with, you know, that we're all doing together here at Ford Pinellas. And with that, um, I think that's good. Thank you for coming today and having lunch with me. I love to have lunch with people. And uh, do we have any upcoming events? We have a lot of upcoming events, but I'll <laughs> spare good. going over we'll them. We'll spare it. Okay. <laughs> and with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you for coming today.